I am so excited. This is the 15th year that we've been doing this. And look at this group. This is awesome. So my job is to say welcome and thank you for coming to hear Kate Clifford Larson, author of Rosemary, The Hidden Kennedy Daughter. Before starting, uh, we do request that you please turn off your cell phone or turn it way down so that there's no noises because Kate's going to be showing um, some audio. Um, you're right there. Uh, <laughs> Okay, and also please no uh, video photography uh, because this is her own particular private little program for us. Uh, my name is Judy Manzo, for those of you who don't know me. Uh, I am the long time, 24 years, uh, owner of the bookstore downtown w Bookends. And I've been a member of the Winchester Reads Committee ever since it started back in 2001. Or, or 2002. It's, uh, as I mentioned, 15th in the series. Uh, this was when a group of citizens after 9-11 uh, uh, came together to connect with others in the community and to understand the motivations, the forces, the underlying major issues facing our country. Nothing's changed. The current members of our committee, our esteemed committee, is being led by our dear Connie Stolo, uh, also, other members are Kathy Richardson, Jerry Driscoll, Sandy Thompson, Joni O'Neill, Teresa Macherevich, Margaret Mackendo, Mary Fiorentino, Rob Ain, Melissa Roderick, and myself. We're grateful to the John and Mary Murphy Foundation, Educational Foundation, for its support over many, many years. This program has also received support from my bookstore, from the Friends of the Winchester Public Library, the Winchester Multicultural Network, and the Winchester Public Schools, as well as many, many uh, enthusiastic volunteers. We will begin uh, the presentation by Kate Larson, followed by a question and answer. Period. After the program, Ms. Larson will be in the lobby. I have a table and chair and everything all set for her to come and autograph your personal copies. Uh, there will uh, also be a, a list of books. I have a list on the table of the 15 years of choices that we've made. And we do have some extra copies of Kate's book uh, for your autographing. I mean, for your purchasing as a gift after you hear her wonderful program. We are fortunate also, one more time, to have our dear local Alan McDonald, the uh, moderator extraordinaire, here to get you all started. Thank you. Thank you, Judy Manzo, and uh, thank you to our esteemed committee, as Judy says, uh, coordinated by Connie Stolo, for putting on this fabulous event. Uh, we've had a lot of fun over the years, as Judy has said, with different uh, authors and different books. Uh, this is absolutely at the top of the line. This was a fabulous choice, and uh, we're going to hear uh, a very interesting presentation uh, about what I think is the most insightful look that I've read about what probably the most famous family that we've all paid attention to, certainly during my lifetime. But there aren't many families outside of royalty, whether it's the Romanovs or the Stuarts or whatever, that have had anywhere near the attention that the Kennedy family has had. And this is an entirely different look, and a very important look, a, a landmark historical look. And that is, uh, as I get to introduce our author, uh, who has spent a lot of time on her focus over the years on women who have had a significant impact on our national identity. And prior to the book that we're going to talk about tonight, uh, Kate Clifford Larson has had two nationally acclaimed biographies, this one will be a third, uh, on some very interesting women. And the first one is Harriet Tubman, and I think you may have seen some of the uh, discussion on this in the local press, but, but Kate did a, a book more than a decade ago on Harriet Tubman, who, as you all know, was a tremendous uh, civil rights activist, uh, an abolitionist, a conductor on the Underground Railway during the Civil War, and of course now to be on the front of the $20 bill moving Andy Jackson to the back of the bill. So that was quite a deal. 
And Kate had a lot to do with it, truthfully so. And uh, she uh, has spun the story and then stayed with it, and it got a lot of attention, and rightfully so with the attention. And she also did a, a biography on Mary Surratt, who was the uh, owner of the uh, hotel or, or uh, bed and breakfast type hotel in those days, uh, where the plot to assassinate Abe Lincoln happened uh, with uh, uh, John Wilkes Booth and his conspirators meeting around the table at Mary Surratt's uh, boardroom, or bedroom boardroom, uh, and uh, that's an interesting story, and again, tremendous impact on a national situation. I wanna say as I introduce Kate, uh, we're so fortunate to have her as a neighbor of all of us in this great town of Winchester. Uh, Kate and Spencer Lassen have been here for 25 years. We were lucky to attract them over time in there. Uh, looking to be in the greater Boston area. And I want to introduce Spencer Lassen before I get to Kate, but right here. And behind Spencer, I want to say we are blessed with so many uh, good, talented people in this town, but another wonderfully talented uh, writer and good friend of Kate's who just was in the paper this past week uh, telling us that after 30 years, we're not gonna see the weekly column anymore, but for all those who have enjoyed any of those 30 years as I have for Terry Marotta, Terry, thank you for all you've done. I understand Terry will still see a piece or two every now and then, which would be fabulous, of course. So tonight's book, Rosemary, the Hidden Kennedy Daughter, is really an example of the tremendous difference uh, love can make. We've had those stories before here, and we're talking about a family where loyalty was obvious, but not necessarily unconditional love, except for the two heroines in this story that we'll hear about. For all that we hear about the Kennedy boys, uh, they are not the heroes of this story. And to think that uh, so many hundreds of thousands of people over 200 countries or so could benefit by the love of Eunice Kennedy Shriver for her sister Rosemary and what it has meant for all of those people who want to make sure that any disability among our population is treated with all of the respect and support to draw out the full abilities to anybody that has disabilities, they're there, and it's shown in the story that Kate tells us of when those abilities did shine and when they weren't allowed to shine, but in the end, the difference is made for so many thousands of people. So we'll have a question and answer opportunity at the end, but let me bring up Kate Clifford Larson. Kate, thank you for being here tonight. Thank you, Alan, and thank you all for coming. Thank you so much to the Winchester Reads Committee, and um, it is a great honor to be here, and uh, I'm just so happy to see all of you here in the audience. Thank you for coming. So tonight I'm going to tell you a little bit about myself, how I came to write about Rosemary in the first place, and the journey that I took um, to research her life at the beautiful Kennedy Library um, here in Boston. For those of you who have not been there, please go, it's fantastic. And um, what I learned about Rosemary and how putting Rosemary at the center of the Kennedy family story sort of, well, it forced me, and I hope you all will see how putting her at the center of the story sort of changes the way you might look at the Kennedy family. Um, and as Alan mentioned, you know, we focus so much on the boys, the successful boys, and the tragedies of those boys in that family. But when you look at the women, that story is a little bit different. So, um, Back in 2005, Rosemary died. It was January, and she was 86 years old, and there was an obituary in the Boston Globe, and it was about three paragraphs long, and um, I read it, and it was very touching. There was a photograph of her, and like most of you, you know, I know about the Kennedy family. I knew about them. I had read some of those biographies. Uh, Doris Kearns Goodwin's books and uh, Lawrence Lemer and others. 
So I was aware of Rosemary, but I didn't know much about her, like most of us didn't know much about her. And there was just something about the obituary, and it just kind of hit me. And so I tucked it away, and um, about a week later, my agent, Doe Coover, who is here uh, in Winchester as well, um, I ran into her and she said, I have your next book project. And I said, Rosemary. And she's like, yes, Rosemary. Somehow we just knew that that might be a possibility. But I was working on the Mary Surratt project at the time, so I couldn't look into Rosemary's life. And so I finished the Mary Surratt book, and in 2008, I was ready to start researching Rosemary's life. So I went to the Kennedy Library, and it was a really good time to go there because the Rose Kennedy papers and the Joseph P. Kennedy papers were being opened to the public. The family foundation, the family had gifted them to the presidential library, and at the, according to the deed of gift, there were certain sections of those papers that would be opened, during, you know, based on a timeline over, you know, 10, 20 years. So um, when I arrived there, what had they recently opened but Rose's diaries and journals and some of the letters that she had written and that the children had written to her? And there were Rosemary's letters from when she was a child and a teenager and young adult woman. And so I knew that I could write a biography because I had her voice. And that was enough for me to be able to pursue a lot of research. It took a long time. It took six years of researching and trying to figure out how to keep her at the center of the story. So this is what I learned about Rosemary, and I hope um, for those of you who have not read the book, and even those who have, that you'll come away loving Rosemary at least a little bit. Uh, I know that I fell in love with her, and I hope that you do too. So Rosemary was born um, in September of 1918. And this was just as the uh, World War I was ending, but the Spanish influenza was hitting Boston at that time. And it was the second time that the flu had traversed the globe. It had killed millions of people, and it was killing thousands in Boston. Um, Rose went into labor, and she had hired an obstetrical nurse to be with her in the few days leading up to what she assumed would be the date of her labor. And that obstetrical nurse had been trained to deliver a baby, but she also had been trained to hold that birth off as long as possible until the doctor could arrive. But Rose's doctor was delayed at the hospital because there were so many people sick with the flu. So the nurse tried to get Rose to not push when the contractions came. Well, that's impossible. And so this is her third labor, too. She already had two little boys at home, Joe Jr. and Jack. And so the nurse told her to cross her legs and hold her legs together. That didn't help, of course. So when the baby was coming and Rose could not help but push baby Rosemary out, the nurse held baby Rosemary back in the birth canal for two hours until the doctor could arrive. So, of course, that's horrifying when we hear that today, but that was not something that was necessarily unusual at that time. Rose was so thrilled to have a baby girl. She'd had these two little boys who were little toddlers and rambunctious, and, and Rose had grown up with sisters, and she was just thrilled to have a baby girl. So her world seemed complete and perfect. And she and Joe were um, establishing their home in Brookline, and it was a nice middle-class life, and everything seemed perfect. Um, the photographs that I have here are the early photographs that Rose had taken with baby Rosemary and her two brothers, Jack and Joe. And you can just see how lovely the family was, and there was so much promise there. But as Rosemary aged, they noticed that she was not developing as fast as the boys had. She was slower to sit up, slower to crawl, much slower to walk, much slower to talk. And at first, Rose and Joe thought, oh, she's a girl. She's going to be slower than the boys. <laughs> Believe it or not, they wrote that in their letters that I found at the library. They just assumed that she just would develop differently because she was a little girl. But then, as the Kennedys um, had more children, Kick arrived 18 months later. 
Um, here's a picture of Rosemary with Kick and then Eunice 18 months after Kick was born. And um, those girls developed very, very quickly. And it became more and more obvious as Rosemary aged that she had some disabilities. When she was five years old, they enrolled her at the Edward Devotion School in Brookline, and they, the teachers immediately knew that Rosemary was disabled. Compared to all the other five-year-olds that they had been teaching for years and years, they just knew. They kept Rosemary back in kindergarten at least once, possibly twice. In the meantime, Kick comes into the same kindergarten classroom, and then uh, Eunice. So uh, the, the Kennedys cannot deny any longer that there's something wrong with Rosemary. She can't keep up with her peers. But the Kennedy family decided to move to New York. Joe's career was taking off, and they wanted to um, have a, uh, they felt they would have better opportunities and a better life in New York. Joe was frustrated with sort of the Yankee Brahmin elite in Boston, and as an Irish Catholic, he felt that they were prejudiced against him, and he just wanted to escape this and go to New York and find success there, which he did do. And they continued to have more children, but they also observed that Rosemary still could not do basic things that other children her age could do. She couldn't ride a bicycle. And this photograph shows her sitting on a tricycle. Um, and as I got to know Rosemary during my research, I, I got to understand that she was a very willful child. And she demanded what she wanted, and often she would get it. So when I see this picture with her sitting on a tricycle, knowing she could not ride it, I could just see her demanding that they put her on that tricycle and take her picture, because she was a big girl, and that's what she was going to do. The other photograph is Rosemary on a sled. Another thing she could not do was steer a sled on a, um, a snow-packed hill. Um, the man in the sled with her is Eddie Moore. Uh, Eddie Moore was Joe's right-hand man in business and in all things that Joe did. And Eddie and his wife Mary did not have children, and they became sort of aunt and uncle to all the Kennedy children. And Eddie Moore was Rosemary's godfather. So he was particularly close to Rosemary. Both he and his wife were very close to her, and they basically would end up taking care of her a lot as she aged into her teen years and young adulthood. So he was a fixture in Rosemary's life. Um, one of the amazing things that I learned about the Kennedys, that uh, in a way they were sort of ahead of their time, um, they insisted that all the children be each other's best friend, have each other's back, and teach each other so that the older children would teach the younger children how to play sports and to do things and help with homework. And so the family was very inclusive, and they required that the children, all of Rosemary's siblings, accommodate her disabilities. There was no question about it, and that's what those children were raised to do. When they went sailing, Rosemary didn't know how to sail. She couldn't figure it out. So she was, they would tell her she was their crew. They rewarded her all the time. They praised her all the time. When they played tennis with her, which was very difficult, they did the same thing. And swimming, everything they did, those kids accommodated Rosemary. And of course, that would be key to Eunice Kennedy Shriver's goals as an adult woman to push through and force um, the government and communities to be inclusive with people with disabilities. And she would go on to establish the Special Olympics, which I'll talk about later. But that early ethic in that family about inclusion and accommodation really influenced Rosemary's siblings. And it made for a happy life for Rosemary. Um, these photographs are taken from a time that they were spending vacations uh, at uh, Cohasset before they purchased their home in Hyannisport. This is where they spent their summers. And um, the photograph on your right is Joe with uh, several of the children. And Joe was an incredibly affectionate father. Now, we've all heard the horrible stories about him. He was not the greatest husband. Um, and he was a very demanding father, but he was very, very loving. And the children loved him and responded to him in kind. And going through the Kennedy um, papers, it was interesting to see all the letters that the children would write to their parents. And invariably, they would write to their father and say, Dear Daddy, you know, I love you so much. Thank you. And, you know, just you're wonderful. And 
etc. And when they wrote Rose, they would say, Dear Mother, and the, the letters were much more formal. She didn't have that kind of cuddly relationship with her children that Joe did. And um, it was just a difference in parenting styles. But these were the happiest times for Rosemary when she was with her siblings and her family. As she aged, um, they couldn't keep, the Kennedys couldn't keep putting her in regular classrooms. During those years in the 1920s and 1930s, um, public schools and even private schools did not have the tools or the educational materials or, or training, the teachers didn't have the training to provide um, curriculum materials for children with intellectual disabilities. So the teachers struggled, Rosemary struggled, she always would get frustrated, the teachers would get frustrated. So eventually the Kennedys had to admit that something just wasn't working anymore. So they enrolled her in a private school called the Devereux School outside of Philadelphia. And it was run by Helen Devereux, who was a pioneer in this very um, infant kind of uh, field of education in learning how to train children who had intellectual disabilities. Helen Devereux had developed uh, curriculum materials for the Philadelphia school system and was quite successful. So she went off and started her own boarding school to take care of or to train children with disabilities, uh, children of, of wealthy families because it cost a lot of money to send your child there. So when Rosemary was 11 years old, the Kennedys decided to send her away from this sort of cocoon, this family environment where she felt safe, and they sent her to this boarding school. And not only did she have intellectual disabilities, which the Kennedys at this point still were not convinced that she had them, um, she also was emotionally immature. So when she was sent to the school, it was a very, very difficult transition for her. And she acted out and caused a lot of problems. And unfortunately, the school had a couple of rules. They were that the children had to behave and they had to do well in their lessons or they couldn't go home for Thanksgiving. And Rosemary knew this, and it, you know, she was afraid, and yet she's frustrated, she's acting out. In fact, there was a telegram in the Kennedy papers. Uh, Rose, um, as she had more and more children, she started this habit of, of going away on extensive vacations to Europe and elsewhere. And so she was away on a six-week European tour when Rosemary was sent to this school. And um, so, Joe sent her a telegram to say that Rosemary, quote, had raised Cain the first few weeks of school, but that she was settling down. And this is like mid-October. Um, and, and then he's getting letters from teachers that Rosemary is not doing all that well in school. But Rosemary is writing her father and saying, Dear Daddy, um, guess what, I'm doing so well in school, I'm getting 100 in math and 100 in English, and so please tell Mrs. Devereaux to let me come home for Thanksgiving. But of course, the exact opposite was happening. So my heart ached for her. You know, this poor little girl was desperate to, to, um, to do the right thing and to have her father approve of her and so she could come home for Thanksgiving, but in reality, that wasn't really happening. These photographs are, um, w the one on the left is uh, Rosemary's probably about 13. And the other photograph, she's probably about 11 or 12 or so, and she's reading one of those Hollywood variety magazines. And of course, her father was deeply involved in making films in Hollywood, and she loved sort of that whole Hollywood scene. And she loved beautiful clothes and having her hair done and her nails done. And she was, in that respect, very much like her mother. Um, and as she grew older, the Kennedys became concerned about her sort of emphasis on a social life and, and beautiful clothes and things like that. But as a child, she was just ador adorable, but suffering under these expectations that she could not meet and these goals that she could not achieve. Um, and so as she became a teenager, she would act out more and more and become more and more frustrating for teachers. Between the time that she was 11 years old and 18, she was sent to five different schools. 
Um, she stayed at the Devereux School a couple of years, um, but the Kennedys were frustrated that she wasn't learning. So they sent her to convent academy schools and other private schools. But in reality, none of these schools were equipped to teach Rosemary. And there was only just so far she could go. I estimate that she probably achieved a third to maybe a fourth grade uh, educational level. Um, here she is another great happy time when she was with her family. She was with them during the summer times. Um, and this photograph has all the children except for Teddy. I think that uh, Rose is pregnant with uh, Ted Kennedy at this time in this photograph. But you can just see her happy to be with her siblings. And as I said, they were very, very close. Here's a copy of a letter that's from the library. And Rosemary wrote this when she was 16 years old. And I know from letters in the collection that um, when she would write a letter like this, the teachers would sit with her. And sometimes it would take two or three times, maybe even more, for her to write a letter as that would end up looking like this because she, her mis, she would misspell a lot. She had no sense of center, sentence structure. Um, they would have to put uh, lined paper under the note paper so that she could follow and not write crooked so that it would be straight across the page. And this is probably one of the better letters in the collection. Most of them are very difficult to read and, um, and uh, you can just tell that she struggled with writing. Um, and once again, of course, she says um, how much she wants to make her father happy and doesn't want to disappoint him in any way. Practically every letter she wrote, she would say those things. And it's just heartbreaking because there was no way that she could achieve and meet the expectations of her parents, who struggled, frankly. They had this child who had difficulties, and they did not know what to do. They didn't have the resources in the public school system that we have today, and even private resources really were not available to them to help them educate their daughter who was disabled. So uh, one of the interesting things that the Kennedys did out of desperation, um, they met a doctor in Boston who was a famous endocrinologist, and he had discovered that hormones affected growth which was new at the time. We all know that now, but at the time they did not know that. And he assumed that hormones also affected intellectual development. So he convinced the Kennedys to give Rosemary hormone injections every week for a year. And he promised them, quote, she would be 100% after the injections. So poor Rosemary is like 15 years old, and she's going to these weekly hormone injections. So I don't know what they were giving for hormone injections in 1935, but I, I'm afraid to even research what that must have been. And I can't imagine what it was doing to a 15-year-old girl's body as they're trying to cure her of intellectual disabilities. It's also about this time she starts exhibiting some mental health issues. She is definitely acting out a lot and not just kind of teenage acting out. She's hitting people. She's throwing incredible tantrums. And people are afraid of her. Now, at that time, they did not have psychopharmaceuticals like they do today. There were no resources for the Kennedys to even medicate her if that was the appropriate thing to do. They were at a loss. They were really at a loss. So they kept grasping at straws, you know, the doctor and the hormones. That was going to work. They sent her to the most famous psychologist and psychiatrist in the Boston area. That wasn't working. And actually, there were some doctors that said to them, really, you should stop. You should just, you know, kind of adjust to this and accept that she is intellectually disabled. But the Kennedys were so keen on basically being high achievers and perfect that they just could not accept that Rosemary was not going to be as bright or as able as her siblings. In 1938, um, Joe was appointed ambassador to Great Britain. And the family was thrilled and excited. Rose was beyond happy. 
Uh, she was such a political being. She had, she was raised and is uh, Honey Fitzgerald's uh, daughter. He was the famous and notorious mayor of Boston. She loved the political limelight. And so she knew this would be an incredible opportunity for the family to be on a world stage, that their sons, who were now going into their 20s, would have an opportunity to meet famous politicians and kings and queens and dukes and duchesses and the greatest minds of the world when they traveled to London. And she wanted her children to be exposed to this kind of worldly life. So the family all packed up in the spring of 1938 and headed to London. Uh, Rose made Eunice and Rosemary here in the photograph on the left come last because they wanted to prepare the house so that when Rosemary came and she always had difficult transitions that they would be ready for her. Um, the other photograph is of Kick, Kathleen, and she was, um, she had just finished high school and this was going to be an amazing time for her. She would partake in all the society functions and it was going to be a very exciting time for her. Even though she was 18 months younger than Rosemary, it was Eunice, who was three years younger, who would be the closest to Rosemary and spend the most time of any of the sisters um, with her. So. Um, the family all is there in London. This is a famous photograph for any of you who have read any of those Kennedy, li or Kennedy books. Um, you've seen this photograph. It's just a magnificent um, family portrait. All of the children are there. Teddy was about uh, six or seven years old when this photograph was taken. Um, and it really, truly was one of the happiest times for the whole family. Two weeks after Rosemary and Eunice arrived in London, um, Rose, had Rose and Joe had decided that the girls would be presented to the King and Queen at the Court of St. James during the debutante season. And it was a huge time during, for London society and all the eligible young wealthy women and their mothers, uh, young girls and mothers, the debutantes and their mothers were presented to the king and queen. And it's a very formal event with all these rules and regulations, but Rose was thrilled to be able to have her two daughters be presented to the king and queen. So um, they, ha they had to be trained in a special curtsy that you're supposed to do in front of the king and queen, and there's a special handshake, and the way you hold your little bouquet of posies, and all these things that you had to learn. So it took two weeks for them to train Rosemary. Kick learned in about an hour or two, but for Rosemary, it took every day they would have to drill her on this. They were so worried that she would stumble and fall in front of the king and queen. Rose bought gorgeous designer gowns for the girls and for herself. And here is a photograph of them at the ambassador's residence with a bank of photographers taking pictures of them. And the f there are actually uh, two or three more rows of photographers behind them taking pictures. And their entire time in London and in Europe, they traveled around a lot over the next two years. Um, there were photographers following them everywhere because the Kennedys were huge news, both society news and uh, political and business news. So the photographers were all, always there. But they had Rosemary trained not to really talk in public, that she would refrain from conversations, that she was never available for interviews. So the photograph um, on the right-hand corner just kind of encapsulates my view of Rosemary charming, cute, and a little sort of impish. Um, she has this glint in her eye and she's smiling for the cameras. And because she was so quiet, she didn't really talk much, she had this allure to her and the photographers loved that and they loved her and they couldn't get enough of her. So I love that smile of her, she was stunningly beautiful. Um, during the presentation, she goes to the front before the king and queen and she curtsies. She stumbles a tiny bit but catches herself and it was an entire success and the evening was beautiful. The next day, the newspapers were filled with stories about this presentation at court of all these young women and their mothers and the dresses and they featured Rosemary and her beautiful gown and they did a write up about her gown. In Rose's diaries, she talks about how angry she was that Rosemary got the attention because she really wanted Kick to get the attention. And then she was doubly mad because the press 
um, dumped all over Rose because Rose wore that white dress with silver flowers on it and married women are not supposed to wear white in front of the king and queen. So they were kind of like, snow, you know, giving her a hard time that <laughs> she was this upstart American who didn't know the protocol, so she was furious. But Rosemary had a fabulous night and all that training paid off. But I tell you this because this is what they had to go through for Rosemary. They had to prepare her over and over and over again, and they didn't want people to know that she was intellectually disabled. Another beautiful photograph of her, I think it was taken probably the same trip into Ireland where the cover of my uh, book comes from. But just lovely, beautiful, really. And everyone was intrigued by her because she was so quiet. Um, and the, but the Trent Kennedys did not want people having conversations with her because it would just take about a paragraph worth of conversation and you would figure out that she wasn't quite acting like a 20-year-old. They traveled all over Europe, Eddie and Mary Moore, governesses, um, companions, always accompanied Rosemary and the children whenever they traveled. This is from someplace in Italy. They're walking down the street. There's actually film footage at the Kennedy Library, like the BBC followed them wherever they went and followed them walking down the street. Um, it's pretty funny, but that, that's what they did. And Teddy was quite the showman. He was always like, you know, talking and waving to all the press. Um, so in the beginning, Rosemary was invited to a lot of these events, these social events, and um, she was there at the ambassador's residence when they would have parties, but she was controlled a lot. I don't know if you can tell, but Joe is sort of holding her arm kind of tightly and awkwardly in that photograph. And then Eddie Moore, always the steady Eddie Moore, he accompanied Rosemary wherever so that if someone's trying to fill out her dance card or whatever, Joe, uh, Eddie was kind of monitoring who the young men that were coming to ask her to dance. Her brothers would often fill her dance card and sometimes they would find special friends that they could trust to dance with Rosemary. And Rosemary actually got frustrated with this. She writes in a couple of letters that she's like, why is it that my brothers dance with me all the time? I want to dance with other boys. But they didn't want her to dance with other boys because they didn't want anyone to know. But of course, young men were very attracted to her. She was beautiful. She smiled and giggled all the time. And, but the family was united in protecting her. Uh, Eunice gave an interview later in life and she talked about how the pressure on she and Kathleen was pretty great when they would go to parties with her and they would watch her because if she went to get her lipstick to reapply her lipstick they would rush and do it for her because if they didn't and she did it herself she would smear it on her face and not know that. So they were petrified that she would do something like that in front of people. So eventually um, Kick and her brothers go out to parties uh, without her and they become vetted and feted all over London society. They're going to every duke and duchess's parties and, and uh, they're quite the eligible siblings. Uh, while Rosemary would accompany her father to like the opening of the London Zoo and things like that. So she was getting frustrated. She wanted to have fun like her older brothers and her younger sister. She knew she was the oldest sister. She knew that she was entitled to have fun too, but her parents wouldn't let her. And in fact, you can see in this photograph that Joe was gripping her again, sort of very tightly so that she wouldn't go off and, and they also worried that she would wander off and get lost or someone would kidnap her or some man would lure her away. So they were constantly watching out for her. One of the great things though that happened to Rosemary while she was there, um, all the children uh, were enrolled in um, convent academy schools there, Sacred Heart Academy schools. And Rosemary was sent to an Assumption uh, a ca Convent Academy school in London that was run by um, Mother Isabel Eugenie, who was an Assumption sister that had been personally trained by Maria Montessori. And this changed Rosemary's life. Mother Isabel took Rosemary under her wing and through that Montessori method gave Rosemary goals that she could achieve, gave her the tools to achieve those goals. So for the first time, Rosemary actually felt successful in a school setting and she felt proud of herself. So she, it was really a wonderful experience for her. Um, 
I love this little picture of the little girls, you know, praying. They're so, little girls so holy for those of us that are Catholic and remember acting that way around nuns. And one of the little girls in this photograph, <laughs> in this photograph um, contacted me through the internet after the book came out and she said, I'm that little girl, the one on the farthest side on the right, praying like that. And she talked about how she had a learning disability and how Mother Isabel changed her life. And now she is a, an education specialist in Los Angeles. Yeah. So um, the war was looming, 1939. Um, Joe and Rose decide to send Rose and all the children back to the United States, except for Rosemary, because she was doing so well, they decided to keep her with Mother Isabel. And the school had moved to the countryside to protect it from any potential bombing of London, which of course would eventually happen. Um, Rosemary continued to thrive there, but in May of 1940, they realized that uh, England was in trouble and they needed to get Rosemary home. So this would be the beginning of the end for Rosemary, unfortunately. Uh, Eddie Moore brought her back to the United States uh, the 1st of June in 1940. Joe was still in England. Um, his career was soon to end, but uh, President Roosevelt had not recalled him yet. And um, Rose was not prepared to take care of Rosemary. And so I'm going to tell this little story that uh, Terry Marotta was so kind to share with me when I was working on this book. I'm going to abbreviate it, and I'm, I hope I don't get a little bit of it wrong, but um, you can ask her about it. <laughs> So I'm working on this book and I, I contacted um, Terry because I had seen a posting that she had made on her blog about um, this camp that her mother and aunt had, w had once run in Western Massachusetts for young girls. And um, she had this little posting about how Rosemary had gone to this camp. So I contacted Terry and she was incredibly wonderful and said, I have stuff to show you. So we met it at um, Whole Foods and we sat down and she had this file of photographs and letters. So Rose, this is what I learned. Rose contacted Carolyn and Grace Sullivan and um, they were daughters of someone that her, uh, Rose's father had known. And she said to them, I have a daughter who's been trained as a junior counselor. Will you hire her for the summer at your camp? And they're, of course, well, yes, of course Mrs. Kennedy will do that. So Rose, not telling them that Rosemary was disabled, um, sends Rosemary off to this camp in the summer of 1940. Well, it probably took a couple of days, maybe not even that, probably a day for Carolyn and Grace Sullivan to realize, uh-oh, this young woman is not a junior counselor. She actually needed someone to be with her all the time. And Terry told me about how Rosemary would wander off into the woods in the middle of the night. Uh, Carolyn and Grace had to bring her into their cabin and put a dresser up against the door so she wouldn't wander off at night. So they contact Rose and ask her to come get Rosemary. And Rose <laughs> basically says no, and she runs off to the Elizabeth Arden Spa in, in Maine. So after a month, finally, Eddie Moore uh, retrieves uh, Rosemary when one of, um, I think it was Carolyn, actually, that had to take Rosemary to New York City and leave her with Eddie Moore. And Carolyn and Grace are running this camp. You know, they can't take uh, two days off to run to New York City with Rosemary. But that's what they had to do because Rose left the responsibility up to them, which is tragic because here is a young woman, Rosemary, who needed constant um, care. She needed to have somebody with her all the time. It was so unfair to the Sullivan sisters. Rosemary was then sent to an assumption school in Philadelphia that lasted about a month. Her father came home from London disgraced. Um, President Roosevelt withdrew him because he was an isolationist and he said some pretty terrible things while he was in London. So. Um, Joe tried to find schools for her in the Washington, D.C. area for her to attend. Convent Academy schools, again, not appropriate places for her. She's now, you know, 22, 23 years old. She doesn't belong in these schools. She's getting frustrated. She's acting out. Um, by the way, these are from Terry Marotta. This is a photograph of Rosemary at the camp. 
And then there were a series of letters that Rosemary wrote to Carolyn and Grace Sullivan and the camp counselors there. And they were just pages of pages of Rosemary saying, I'm so sorry, I'm crying all the time, I'm so upset, I'm, I, 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 I disappointed my daddy, I need to work harder and, and make him happy, and I want to see you again, I hope I can come back. It's just her heart pours out in these letters. It is so heartbreaking, because she doesn't understand that she's really done nothing wrong. It's just that her mother had set her up sort of to fail at this camp. It was so unfair. Thank you, Terry, again. So this all brings us to this fateful decision that Joe makes. She's at these convent schools in Washington, DC. She's escaping at night. The nuns have to go out, and they find her on the street at 2 o'clock in the morning. Her clothes are all a mess. She's been drinking. So Joe starts investigating this new surgery called a prefrontal lobotomy that is being conducted by uh, Walter Freeman and James Watts at George Washington University Hospital. They had, the surgery had started in Spain in the 1930s where they cut the frontal lobes to help people with mental illness. And um, they were experimenting at this hospital. When, in 1941, they were touting the success of this surgery to the press. They were saying that most of their patients come out able to live independent, happy lives. Some of them have to have some care afterwards, but generally most of them are good to go after the surgery. When I looked into their actual research at the time, the exact opposite was the truth. Most of the patients came out of the surgery unable to live alone anymore. They were no longer independent. They needed help. Some of them were completely disabled and 16% died. They didn't tell the press that. But that summer of 1941, the American Medical Association came out and said that they, recommend, they did not recommend the surgery until more research had been done and it shouldn't be done on live patients. During that time, there were no research protocols when it came to things like this. There were no patient protections. These men could do whatever they wanted to do. So Joe discussed this with Rose. Rose went to Kick, who is now a reporter in Washington, D.C., and asked her to investigate this surgery. And Kick did that. She went back to her mother and said, Mother, this isn't something we should do to Rosemary. The results are just not good. So Rose claims in her memoir that she had no idea that Joe was going to do this. In fact, she did know about the surgery. I doubt that she gave her permission. I think Joe went ahead and did it anyway. So he defied what the, the American Medical Association was recommending, and the Catholic Church at the time was refusing to allow the surgery to be conducted in their uh, hospitals. He knew this. He had to have known this. He was a smart man. He investigated everything. So before Thanksgiving in November of 1941, he forced Rosemary to have this surgery. The surgeons cut too much, and she became completely and horrifically disabled. She couldn't walk or talk. She was incompetent and incontinent. Um, it was a horrific mistake. She was one of the ones that was totally disabled as a result of the surgery. He sent her to uh, the Craig Psychiatric Hospital in Beacon, New York, which was not an appropriate place for her. She needed rehab. She wasn't a psychiatric patient at that point. She was physically disabled. She needed a lot of rehabilitation. In 1949, he sent her to St. Coletta School in Jefferson, Wisconsin, which was run by the Benedictine nuns. And it was a school, a residential facility for children and adults with intellectual disabilities. He wrote to the nuns there who welcomed Rosemary. And they said, he said to them, um, thank you. Uh, you are the answer to the problem of Rosemary. Rose, after the surgery, Rose did not see her daughter for 20 years. In fact, the weekend after Thanksgiving, she sat down and wrote a letter to all of her children. And she was in the habit of writing these round-robin letters where she would put every child's name at the top, and then the letter would have a paragraph about each child, and she would send it to all the children. That first letter after Thanksgiving no longer had Rosemary's name, and she was not mentioned in the letter. 
She was excised from the family. Eunice said later to her children that it was 10 years before she even knew where Rosemary was. She had no idea what had happened to her. Ted, our former senator in his memoir, wrote that he was nine years old when the surgery took place. He had no idea what happened to Rosemary. All he knew, he wrote, is that he'd better behave or he might disappear too. So the family just didn't talk about it. Um, but the St. Coletta's was a great place for Rosemary. She regained her ability to walk. And um, interestingly, they started taking her off some of the medication that she had been taking at the Craig House. And once they did that, she began to talk. Um, she would continue to, for the rest of her life to have a limp and one of her arms was not as flexible as it had been before and her neck sort of tilted to one side. Um, she had friends there, she was well cared for, the Kennedys built a home for her on the grounds of the school. Um, one or two nuns lived with her in the house and she had a rich life um, given what limitations that she did have. In 1958, uh, Jack was on the campaign trail and he was in Wisconsin and he took a secret side trip to um, the school to see Rosemary. He was the first one to see her and it changed him. He would go on um, and, uh, to help sponsor and sign legislation to fund resources into research on um, uh, maternal and child health and intellectual disabilities. Eunice would be the power behind him once he became uh, president. In fact, she basically forced him into creating a presidential commission to investigate the causes of uh, disabilities in children, uh, maternal, um, uh, child health, and more. And um, so she, she, some of the legi the. Uh, records at the Kennedy Library are pretty funny because some of Kennedy's aides complained to him about Eunice, how she's such a pest about all this stuff. And he would say to them, whatever Eunice wants, you get her. So she really was the powerhouse behind um, Jack Kennedy passing some of this legislation. This photograph is a picture of uh, Jack signing an important piece of maternal health uh, legislation, re funding for research, establishing a new institute at the National Institute of Health dedicated to maternal and child health care, which they did not have before. Um, this was just maybe three weeks before he was assassinated. So they were transformed by Rosemary and what happened to her. The family did not come out until 1962 and admit to the world that Mary Rosemary had been born with intellectual disabilities. They did not admit that she'd had mental illness or mental health issues. They did not admit that she'd had a lobotomy. But it gave Rose this opportunity to come out to the world and really find a place for herself. And she helped fund and um, spearhead ca fundraising campaigns to build research centers at universities and hospitals around the country. She went to visit Rosemary for the first time in 1962, just before they announced to the world that Rosemary was intellectually disabled. And the report is that when Rosemary saw her, she screamed and hit her mother. She was so angry and frustrated. She remained angry with her mother for the rest of her life. She blamed Rose for what had happened. Rosemary didn't forget who she was. She always knew who she was. She knew who her siblings were. Um, these are just photographs of Rosemary as an older woman. After Joe died in 1969, he had had a stroke in 61 and couldn't walk or talk, ironically. Um, but he died and then Rose started bringing Rosemary home for vacations, one time a year in Palm Beach, one time a year in Hyannisport. And the good thing about this is that it gave the younger generations of kids an opportunity to get to know their aunt that they did not know before. And they too were transformed by her and they loved her deeply. Um, and here's a picture of her um, swimming with them in the water in Palm Beach. And these are pictures of, of Rosemary with the nuns that would fly with her to the East Coast to spend time with the family. But her visits with her mother were always strained and difficult, in spite of how much good time she had with the nieces and nephews. 
Um, Anthony Shriver, I interviewed him. He was uh, very giving of his information, um, and he shared photographs with me, his private uh, photographs, and we selected two of them for the book. Um, he loved his aunt deeply. He was deeply affected by her. And here's a picture of him. I think it was a birthday party, and they had given her a, a toaster oven. He actually built an addition on his house in Miami so that she could come and visit him and his family with the nuns when she was still alive. Um, and he went on to establish uh, Best Buddies, which we all know here in Massachusetts. Eunice, of course, went on to establish the Special Olympics, which affects the lives of millions of people and their families around the world today. That combination of sports, the Kennedys and their sports and their competitiveness, and the attitude that people can be able and they can have fun and they can achieve goals and, um, and be part of a community. And so she really was deeply influenced by watching what happened to Rosemary as a child and the difficulties her parents had in trying to find accommodations for her and ways for her to share in everybody's life. Um, and she helped transform this country, certainly. Uh, Jean Kennedy Smith is the last sibling that's still alive. She established very special arts for people with disabilities and that's still going strong. And of course our Senator Ted Kennedy, um, he sponsored or assigned um, hundreds of pieces of legislation related to funding, accommodation, uh, other resources for uh, people with disabilities in this country, including the Americans with Disabilities Act, which we all benefit from today. Um, and this is Best Buddies um, that Anthony Shriver has started, which pairs college students with um, teenage disabled, uh, intellectually disabled children. And um, Tom Brady is their spokesperson. They have this big um, challenge in the springtime where they ride, I think, 50 miles and raise money for the Best Buddies program. So Rosemary's life was tragic, but certainly her legacy is something that we all benefit from, we share today, because this nation is a far better place for people with you know, disabilities. And I think that if Rosemary had not been born disabled and struggled and the things that happened to her, I'm not sure about whether her, her siblings would have gone on and made the contributions that they made to make this place a better world for all of us. Thank you very much. Kate, that's just uh, phenomenal research, wonderful writing, great storytelling of the hundreds and hundreds of books written about the Kennedy family. None of them touches the situation the way you do. Yeah. And uh, what a lesson. And the lesson to me is that even in Rosemary's disability, uh, she was able to function with the Assumption Sisters at Montessori in a very positive way and be a happy person. But back in the chaotic life of the Kennedy family, which was great competition and, and excellence in uh, all deeds, it was very hard for her to succeed and be happy. And we had a family, unfortunately, at least in Rose's case, and even in Joe's case in the, in the end of embarrassment about disability in the family, and even beyond embarrassment, the inconvenience of having to deal with it in their daily lives. It turns around in the end through Eunice. That's a fabulous story. And uh, Anthony and Tim Shriver, as Kate writes in the book, uh, the uh, Shriver boys, Eunice's sons, when asked, what drives your mother to work so hard to establish the Shriver camp in the early 60s and the Special Olympics in 68, the very year that Bobby is shot, three weeks later, they're unveiling the first major Special Olympics program. Kate writes about that. But the question to the Shriver boys was, what drives your mother so much? And, and they said, anger drives our mother. But of course, Eunice says, love gave me the confidence, and uh, adversity gave me the purpose. And it's a fabulous story, and the heroines of this story, which we did not see in the other Kennedy books, are really two wonderful women who have now established a legacy that affects hundreds of thousands, if not millions of people, I would say, uh, around the globe. So uh, that's where we are. Was, uh, Kate, you've done a fabulous, uh, 
fabulous good deed for bringing this story out, and it's going to get more and more attention as we go. And I think that we're so fortunate to have you right here in our backyard doing all that beautiful research and writing. It's fabulous. So are there any questions and comments that we have? The, I'm sure we're all stirred by this uh, as much as I am, but uh, would anybody, yes, like to have a comment? Um, the question is, uh, uh, the question is um, did Ro why did Rose not visit Rosemary for 20 years, and did Joe prevent Rose and the children from visiting her? When it came to Rose, Rose did whatever she wanted, and Joe let her do whatever she wanted. He never could have told her not to visit Rosemary. The, the children, on the other hand, I have no doubt they were told, the one, I, Joe and Jack and Kick knew that Rosemary was in a hospital someplace, but they didn't know the details. They were probably told, you can't visit her. The only people that did visit her were Eddie and Mary Moore, and that was it. So I think Jack did it on his own without his father's knowledge in 1958. Do you think or have any evidence that um, Rose felt guilty about the birth? So um, I don't think she felt guilty about it because first of all, they didn't know that sort of uh, delaying a birth like that or depriving a baby of oxygen created uh, disabilities like cerebral palsy or intellectual disabilities, et cetera, at the time. That wasn't discovered till like the 1950s or 60s. And in giving all these lectures over the past year, I can't tell you how many women have come up to me and said, that happened to me in the 1940s, that happened to me in the 1950s, that happened to me in the 1960s. So it, there, there was no connection between the two. I'm sure it was an uncomfortable birth for her, but she didn't connect it until the 1960s when she became aware of the research and that's when it kind of clicked for her that it probably happened at that time and Eunice believed that it probably happened then as well. Originally they used to tell people that Rosemary became disabled because of scarlet fever that she got when she was five years old but her disabilities were evident from the time she was an infant. So, yeah. Of course what else comes out from Kate's writing is that there were tens of thousands of lobotomies done in the 1940s and 50s, which is criminal when you think of it at this stage of the game, but there really was the lack of understanding about disability, the lack of medical attention, and the lack of will, it seems to me, to find a way to help people with disabilities uh, get the most out of what they have as abilities, right. which is, of course, where the society is driving us now, thank goodness. Right. And the tragedy is the great majority of lobotomy patients were women. Uh, a father, a husband, a brother, a son could force a woman to have a lobotomy. There were no patient protections. And even though women actually were um, a lower percentage of psychiatric commitments, they were the highest number of lobotomies. So it's just, and they did it to women who were, you know, prostitutes, or if they were sexually active, they would, you know, a, a male relative would have them lobotomized, or if they smoked pot, you know, they'd have them lobotomized. It was really, really a terrible, terrible thing. Anyone else? And we are going to, when we finish, we're going to ask back. When we finish, we're going to have, as Judy Manzo says, an opportunity to meet with Kate in the back and, and have books signed if you want. I have a question. Um, I got the impression I couldn't believe how despicable those parents were in their own way. They were pretty despicable, I thought. Um, I got the feeling that at one point you mentioned that she was getting to be a little sexually aggressive or they were worried that she'd, something would happen to her and they'd be embarrassed. It seems like it was more of an embarrassment to have her in the family because she, what she could do, get in the newspapers or get pregnant or whatever. And um, did you ever find out how Joe Kennedy ever, uh, did he have any misgivings ever or feel any uh, it, he, guilt or anything? No? I never found anything in the Kennedy papers that indicated that he had any regrets. I have no, I, I don't believe that he planned on her becoming completely disabled. I, ha I don't think he planned on that. I think he was hoping the lobotomy would just kind of dull her emotions like it did with many people so that she would be much easier to take care of. The frustrating thing for me is they were so wealthy, they could have hired you know, two or three women to live with her in an apartment in New York City and take her out shopping every day and dinner every night in the theater all the time. They didn't have to do this, but I think they were worried that she might end up in a compromising situation 
And I think they were exhausted by trying to take care of her. They just were at their wit's end. I, I just wanted to get rid Kate, of her. Do you think uh, you what Joe Kennedy did, which Kate writes about, is make substantial contributions to St. Coletta's in Wisconsin on an annual basis, mm -hmm. uh, whether that was a, an opportunity for him to atone for the circumstances, uh, we don't know, but, but certainly uh, he didn't forget about it. He made substantial contributions uh, in, in uh, Rosemary's name and for Rosemary's benefit. Right, know? right. She had amazing health care there, yes, yes. If a young woman needs to be self-actualized, she needs to be self-actualized. Too bad Honey Fitz didn't let her go to Wellesley. I know. I was devastated by that she didn't protect Rosemary, and I was equally devastated by the treatment of Kick. I could right. weep. Yeah. Sad. So, and the sad thing about Rose is, yes, she did those horrible things. She didn't protect her daughter Kick. She didn't support her. She didn't protect Rosemary in the end. Um, Rose was a deeply wounded person after her father denied her the great joy of her life to go to Wellesley. And from then on, it seemed like it was a series of disappointments in her life. So she retreated into her faith and she built a wall around her emotions so that she could survive. And, and she did survive the death of all those children and uh, but that faith sustained her, but it kept her at a distance from her children and everybody else as well. And it made her look cruel. It really did. Yeah. Well, I think we, uh, do I don't see any other hands at the moment. Yes, oh. I do. This is like an auction. <laughs> They're still opening them on a timetable. There are, however, about, I would say, a couple hundred letters related to Rosemary that are sealed. I don't expect they're going to be opened. Um, I did see some of the letters that had been sealed that they opened, but then they blacked out the whole letter. So I had no idea what was in the letter. It's very tragic. Some of them are medical records, which I can't see anyway because of HIPAA laws. Um, but that's okay because I don't really need to know what a doctor was saying about her in 1935. Um, but I, I do feel that those letters from the teachers and um, her companions and, and tutors, the, that's crucial information. And so I feel that the family is denying Rosemary's voice. And even if some of it is not attractive, let's say one of those teachers talks about her running off in the middle of the night and drinking with some man, I don't know. We need to know the truth because she was a 20 some odd year old woman. She wanted to have relationships. You know, let's not deny her her womanhood. Let's just tell the truth and, and, and deal with it and move on. Because by keeping that stuff a secret, a lot of people write really awful things that may not be true. And if they let the truth come out, then we all have the answers we're seeking. Well, very, very good. Uh, Kate Clifford Larson, we have been so blessed to have you as our author of the year. Thank you. To be the author of every year. You can thank <laughs>